All right, so now I, I just wanted to take a few minutes to touch a little bit on the uh, CAP planning process, kind of give you a sense as to kind of where we're gonna go from here. Um, so of course we have our uh, CAP team, uh, which is a, this illustrative group here. And just trying to move things out of my way and zooming in. Um, so the team we will uh, uh, organize into sub teams uh, along the lines of those broad categories that I spoke about earlier. And the, the purpose for organizing the sub teams is not to exclude people from being able to contribute, review, or provide input on all of the categories. It's simply because it can become overwhelming and we don't wanna overwhelm anybody. We wanna give people an opportunity to give uh, thoughtful and in-depth input uh, that's meaningful to them uh, without feeling, it, it'll be a fair bit of work. I mean, we try to make it as straightforward as possible, but it's, you know, you guys are, are really gonna be contributing a lot of valuable input. And so we wanna make sure that you, no one gets too overwhelmed. Um, so we will organize uh, into uh, three sub teams um, where there's three groupings of sub teams. And what we would like is ha have everybody sign up for one sub team in each of the three categories, three groupings. Uh, the reason for that, just so you know, uh, is that when we have our future meetings, we'll do workshops where we're gonna do breakout sessions. And in breakout group one, we wanna have everybody have a home to go to. And we don't want anybody to have to have two teams that they're trying to talk to at the same time. So that's why we have groupings. So uh, you'll have access to the sign up sheet um, and you just plug in your name for one of the topics under the green section, one of the topics under the yellow section, and one of the topics under the uh, reddish brown uh, section. And then when we do rounds of breakouts, you'll be able to have a place to go and you won't be pulled in two directions. Um, those are the areas that you will definitely be uh, directly contributing to the most. There is certainly opportunity for you to contribute to the other sections. Uh, we'll do when we come back from breakouts. The uh, teams will give brief uh, summaries of what they're learning. When we issue documents, everything's available for everybody. So if there's if there's categories, you know, some people like I want to I want to have input on everything. Have at it. That's awesome. Uh, so we don't want to exclude that. We just would like to make sure that everybody kind of has a lane to be in when we do uh, small group sessions. And based on the size of the team, we're going to have uh, numbers of signups here that, that try to kind of limit the seating. Um, and again, that's not to keep people from being able to be on the topics that are important to them, but it's we want to make sure every team's got some folks in it, because uh, it would be sad if I were in a sub team all by myself, for instance. <laughs> So uh, when you sign up for the sub teams, if one of the, the uh, sub teams that you really are passionate about or you have some expertise that you know will be helpful, what have you, if, the, if all the slots are taken, uh, just talk to me about it. We'll see what, you know, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, but word to the wise, sign up early. <laughs> um, and again, we'll give links to that in, in the future. Uh, we will then have... Uh, 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 four more uh, team meetings. It says six there. That number is just wrong. Um, so we'll have four more team meetings. We're here at this first team meeting, which is the oops uh, at the introduction uh, of the process. The future meetings are going to be much more workshop oriented. Those green spheres are really much more of a workshop kind of a format. There will be a little bit of presentation for me in like, for instance, uh, number two and uh, probably at the beginning of number three, uh, but I'm gonna talk less and less, and you guys will have more and more time to get together and talk with each other. Uh, there will be a little bit of homework to do between the meetings. Um, so I'm forgetting to uh, click my button here. There will be a little bit of uh, work to do between the meetings. We're gonna try to keep that as light as possible. Usually uh, for this uh, project, that's going to be usually sort of reviewing of content. We're going to produce some stuff, get it to you in advance. Um, and if you can just make sure that you review it for your sub teams. Uh, and again, if you want to review for the other sub teams, absolutely feel free to do so. Uh, but uh, at a minimum, we'll want you to, to try to review the content that we give you for your sub team in advance to the meeting so that when you have your sub team discussions, you'll be able to contribute what you want to contribute based on you know, having a sense as to what, what was provided. Um, 
And uh, there will also be clearly an opportunity for everybody to review the entire draft document also, so towards the end of it. Um, uh, the team meetings are gonna be on Zoom. Um, this is enabling us to stitch together folks from a broad region uh, without people having to uh, get in cars and drive for a couple hours at a time. Um, so that means everybody will need access to a Zoom compatible computer or mobile device. Uh, I will say computers tend to work best in these formats, but uh, a mobile device can work. Um, we will also be sharing uh, documents in both Google Drive as well as Microsoft OneDrive. If you do not have an account for Google Drive or you do not have a Microsoft OneDrive account, that is not a problem. You do not need an account. Uh, they may ask you like, hey, sign up for an account. Uh, you don't need an account. If you sign up for an account, you don't. that's totally optional. Uh, and if you do, you don't need to pay for anything. Um, if you already have a OneDrive account uh, or a shared drive or a Microsoft Teams, it, it might be asking you for a password for those in order to view the OneDrive shared documents. So um, for those documents, you will need access on a computer. Um, I've not seen it work very well on mobile devices. So uh, if you have the ability to get on a computer for sharing those mobile, those shared documents, that would be preferable. Um, uh, and that'll just occur during the, between the workshops. And frankly, during the workshops, it's often nice to be able to pull those up. We'll have some documents that we can take notes on as a group. Um, if, if that's a challenge for you at all, uh, let me know. Uh, we'll figure something out. Uh, again, you don't need to uh, create an account. Um, if you are accessing off of a computer uh, that is you know, a, a company computer of some sort, uh, you may want to check with your IT to make sure that you will be able to access a Google uh, shared file, Google account shared file, or a Microsoft account shared file. Usually that's not a problem, but some organizations might have a firewall uh, thing uh, where they, they don't want you, where it's keeping you from accessing a shared document. So if you think that might be an issue, uh, please check with your IT folks uh, uh, in advance. And, and, and if it's an issue that can't be resolved, let me know and we'll, we'll, we'll figure something out. Okay, so any questions related to that kind of our process moving forward? Um, could you share what the expected, what our time commitments should be for the advanced homework? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, so those sessions to uh, uh, the all in, so we're, we're, we're talking about a meeting a month, you know, give or take, it might, Ever or flow a week or so, but roughly one meeting a month. The meetings will be uh, roughly three and a half hours. Um, and the kind of homework between, we usually say, you know, thinking of it as maybe like a four hour thing. So it, it's about a, a, a full day's worth, eight hours a month, likely. Now, everybody's life is different. Uh, everybody's got different stuff going on. Um, so what often happens, we'll find that there might be some team members that couldn't quite put in the full four hours between meetings. You know, they I could, but I could take a look at, I could spend an hour on it, and that was that's good too. And we also have folks that are that have the time and capacity and interest. Uh, we will try to offer other opportunities. Some people want to dig in deep, um, and so we want to support as deep digging as anybody wants to go. <laughs> So we do, uh, usually on a team, we'll have folks that kind of uh, run the spectrum. I've had people that spend, you know, dozens of hours a month. I'm not telling you that you need to. I'm just telling you that if people are interested, we'll, we'll give you more content. You know, we'll give you as much as we can to support interests. But in general, the team works really well. If you think of it about four hours uh, of pre-meeting kind of time, a little bit of homework, and then the meetings themselves. Any other questions on that? Okay, alrighty, awesome. So I wanted to touch, uh, I'm gonna go kind of a quick pace uh, just to try to give you an overview. Uh, all, everything that I touch on will be accessible to you on the team page, which we'll uh, also touch on. Uh, so our process, we do, uh, we try to do as much sort of uh, foundational research as we can to be as community specific as we can. So these are process documents um, and we they're focused on trying to, this shouldn't be built up, sorry, that's annoying. Uh, so it's uh, the intent is to provide as much background data as we can reasonably. 
um, uh, to help understand sort of the order of magnitude of issues or potentials in each of the sectors, help in uh, creating goals, uh, goals or uh, exploring strategies and actions, and importantly, to give kind of a common basis for discussion. We're all coming uh, from to this conversation from different angles, different experiences, so we're trying to create kind of a baseline. So those uh, foundational documents, there's four kind of researchy documents. Uh, the first is the vulnerability assessment. The second is the greenhouse gas inventory. The third is, uh, it says tree survey, but it's really kind of ground cover uh, study, uh, heat island and carbon sequestration uh, study. And then the fourth is the renewable energy potential uh, study. So all of those are just us exploring, trying to get as much data as we can relevant to those different uh, aspects of uh, climate change considerations for the region. Um, all told, those are some 300 pages of content. You do not need to read uh, all of those documents. You do not need to read those documents. Uh, they are available to you though, if you uh, want to, absolutely. Those, the sort of, um, key learnings that we have from those documents uh, have been put into what we call a climate action baseline assessment and strategic goal recommendations report. This document is much more streamlined. Each of the sectors that I talked about, the uh, uh, eight or so sectors from buildings and energy, health and safety and so forth, they all, uh, our learnings have all been sort of synopsed into, you know, a couple, anywhere between, you know, four to six maybe pages per sector just kind of giving you summary information and uh, an overview of goals. That document we will uh, want you to look at and review, at least for the uh, sub teams that you sign up for. So, you know, it'll be, uh, it'll be a dozen pages or so, maybe 15 pages, uh, depending on which groups you sign up for. So to just kind of give you a sense so that everybody has the benefit of seeing a little bit of what we learned or what's in the documents, um, we're gonna go through them kind of at fast pace. Um, everything that I'm going through is fully available to you if you want to uh, read uh, in uh, more detail. So for the vulnerability assessment, uh, so we look at uh, uh, existing and projected future uh, climate uh, change considerations for the region. Uh, this chart here shows we are seeing an increase in maximum daily uh, average daily temperature. Uh, since uh, 2050, uh, we've seen somewhere around three degrees uh, Fahrenheit. By 2060, uh, we anticipate an increase of uh, about plus six degrees Fahrenheit um, and a 14% decrease in frost free nights. Uh, by 2100, if we do not uh, abate climate change, so this is the future that may be only, <laughs> to use the uh, Christmas Carol uh, statement, uh, if we don't abate by the end of the century, we could be around uh, plus 11 or 12 degrees Fahrenheit average temperature. Um, increasing temperatures also relate to increasing extreme heat days. Uh, uh, by 2050, uh, we can anticipate the region may have a 270% increase in days over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. By the uh, end of the century, that could be roughly a four-time increase uh, or more uh, by the end of the century. Uh, we've seen increasing rainfall already. Uh, this is a great little chart. Uh, 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 put together uh, over the last century, kind of the changing in uh, rainfall patterns uh, throughout the state. Since 1950, uh, our region's seen a, a roughly a 20% increase in annual precipitation. By 2050, we can anticipate uh, roughly a 5% increase. Uh, those projections, by the way, swing a little bit, so there's a little variability to that. Um, and by 10, uh, 2100, we can see uh, maybe a 10% increase in annual precipitation. Um, by the way, uh, what is most important about the precipitation, I, I want to point out, is not just the increase in precipitation, uh, but the increase in uh, variability of rainfall events. And what I mean by that is our rain is going to come, has been coming a little bit further apart, uh, more days between rainfalls, which means uh, we have greater opportunity for drought, uh, grounds get dry out. And it means that when it does rain, it tends to rain heavier. Uh, we're seeing an increase in heavier precipitation. And uh, the state of Minnesota has tracked what they call the mega rain events, which are uh, rain events that deliver six inches or more 
of rain over a thousand square miles. Uh, so that means they're delivering about 14 billion cubic feet of water in one rain event. So just to kind of give you a sense of how much rain that is, that's a cube of uh, that much water sitting on top of Minneapolis. So there are significant rain events. And uh, there's been, uh, you know, 16, 17 of them uh, since they've been tracking weather in the state. Uh, over half of them have been in this century. So it is definitely an increasing uh, phenomenon for Minnesota. As noted, we are also experiencing increasing drought. Um, this year actually has been uh, a part of that experience. Um, so it oftentimes at odd, it feels at odds to people that how can we say we're increasing precipitation and we're increasing drought? It sounds like you're talking nonsense. And it's because uh, those rain events, as I say, are getting pulled apart, which means we have more opportunity for the dry for the ground to get drier, uh, which is a surface drought. And of course, drier ground does not accept water as well as uh, ground that's already got some moisture in it. Uh, so that means when we get a super heavy rainfall on dry ground, we're going to get more runoff. Uh, less of it uh, gets into the ground. So it's kind of a double whammy experience that we have. As we um, think about climate change, I often think of it uh, visually or sort of physically. Um, I think of it as picking communities up and moving them south, because um, that's kind of what's happening in terms of our, client, our climate. So uh, if we think about the projected change uh, by 2100, uh, you know, average summer highs being you know, roughly 11, 12 degrees uh, hotter than they are right now, that's similar to summers currently experienced in northern Texas. So that's uh, kind of like picking up uh, region four and moving it south 12 miles every year uh, through the rest of the century or 173 feet south every day. So just imagine picking up our region and it's on the move. Um, and if we don't abate uh, uh, climate change by the end of the century, we're gonna, it's gonna be similar to living in Texas. So of course these changes do have uh, risks, both physical risks as well as risks to our population. Uh, there are well-established groups of vulnerable uh, populations and climate risks. At the top of this are the, the uh, primary climate risks. Uh, they include things like extreme heat and weather, flooding, uh, air quality considerations, uh, vector-borne disease considerations, food uh, security, water quality, waterborne illness, uh, power or infrastructure failure. And then there's also related economic risks, uh, climate, uh, or excuse me, uh, crop yield impacts, uh, mortality considerations, energy costs, uh, property crime or uh, uh, violent crime. All of those have linkages to climate change uh, projections. Um, we have well-established groups of uh, uh, vulnerability and they're all outlined below. Um, primarily it's folks that, you know, the youth or seniors, uh, individuals with uh, disabilities, so folks that might uh, have some need for support in certain areas. Uh, people uh, under economic stress, uh, you know, it doesn't mean they're, they're less capable, but if you have less money available to uh, solve issues or uh, take care of emergencies, you are more vulnerable. Uh, people of color, at-risk workers, think of first responders, construction workers, folks that are out in the elements, uh, that they live in the elements um, in order to do their jobs and the elements are changing. Uh, and of course, folks that might be vulnerable to food insecurity or individuals that might have limited mobility, access to limited mobility. So in our vulnerability assessment, we've mapped uh, those populations out. The maps that we have are uh, at county level. We have actually also mapped them out at uh, census tract, but to kind of keep things uh, a little bit more straightforward for such a large group, we've mapped them uh, at the county level. And I see uh, Ben's raised his hand. Yeah, thanks. I had a question. Um, I was curious about um, when y'all assign these different uh, climate risks to different vulnerable populations. Uh, how do you do that? Is it based off of like geography? Is it based off of some common sense? Or why would you give like children under five the certain of these uh, climate risks, and not others? How do you make those determinations? It's a it's a, a little bit of a potpourri part art, part science, but kind of thinking through uh, the characteristics of a certain group, what kinds of things might they be vulnerable to because of their exposure? 
or because of the things that they may have the ability to control or may be in able to uh, unable to control or uh, make changes needed to respond to something. So, uh, you know, youth, youth, for instance, are uh, they're vulnerable to things in the environment much more than uh, other folks because they're maybe outside playing. You know, they're out in the environment. Uh, they have a different kind of exposure to it. Uh, food security, for instance, they're going to be more vulnerable to it because they are um, not uh, empowered to be able to go take care of their uh, needs directly. They are dependent on systems uh, a little bit more uh, than others, of course, because they're they're young. So it's thinking through kind of in each category, the kinds of uh, the ability to uh, make uh, adjustments uh, versus the inability to make adjustments. Um, and again, it's not necessarily a reflection of uh, a group's, uh, you know, inability as individuals, it's just simply a recognition of uh, the conditions that they may be faced with. So, so for each of these groups, we've mapped them out, kind of explained a little bit, why are they a sensitive group? And uh, as Ben was just asking about, of those different vulnerabilities, we're uh, identifying the vulnerabilities that they may have heightened sens sensitivity to compared to other groups. Um, and you'll see that then we uh, call out the total number of uh, folks in that vulnerability group and kind of the percentage of the population, and then uh, break that down on a county by county basis also, just so you can kind of kind of feel it out in the different region and your part of the region, kind of the area, uh, the folks, the sectors of vulnerabilities that might be uh, more, uh, more heightened than others. So we've got youth, seniors over uh, 65, individuals with disabilities, uh, individuals under economic stress, uh, people of color, limited in English speakers, um, uh, at-risk workers. So again, first responders, folks that tend to be out in the elements or um, you know working in factories without air conditioning, you know exposed to certain uh, conditions. Uh, individuals with possible limited mobility. Um, also, uh, we have this is from the USDA kind of map of potential areas of uh, uh, potential food insecurity. Uh, I say potential a couple of times here because uh, the USDA's information is based on whether or not there are uh, a full-fledged grocery store that where you can get, think I can get a full meal, vegetables, fruit, the whole kit and caboodle, uh, healthy food. Um, uh, so that's what they define a grocery store as, not a convenience store. Um, and so this map just simply shows, uh, are there grocery stores within uh, a certain distance uh, for folks? And they change the distance depending on whether it's rural or urban. Um, and I say potential because just because there's a grocery store available does not necessarily mean that uh, we don't have food insecurity issues. It, there may be all sorts of issues like uh, uh, availability of certain foods, costs, uh, culturally uh, significant foods, those sorts of things that can add into that. So we don't have a full food security uh, mapping. That actually is a pretty, uh, it's a pretty significant process that you want to go through specifically around that. So what we do is we take all of those, um, uh, oops, I'm sorry, that one chart's not supposed to be showing up yet. <laughs> we take all of those uh, risks uh, and we map out those populations. And from that, we can anticipate um, sort of the risk sensitivity uh, chart. So those areas that are more sense, uh, those uh, parts of uh, our community, when we tally it all up, what sensitivities do we have greatest, uh, what risks do we have greatest sensitivities to? In our region in general, uh, you can see at the top is those uh, risks that we might be more sensitive to uh, working our way down to uh, things that we may be a little less sensitive to. That is not to say that something towards the bottom is not important at all. Uh, it's just simply saying that uh, in terms of the makeup of our community members, what might be kind of uh, uh, higher sensitivity uh, areas. So that chart that was just showing up uh, uh, should have not been showing up there. Uh, so this, we also did, uh, there's a wonderful study that was done by uh, uh, Stanford University about uh, potential economic impacts of climate change. And I will say that it's actually not, uh, it's the most thorough study we've seen. They did it county by county. Uh, it's a wonderful study, and it's also not exhaustive. Um, 
They have in their projected impacts for agricultural yields, uh, energy expenditures, uh, labor productivity, crime, uh, um, and then total those all, all those up in economic impacts. Our region here, by the end of the century, uh, if climate change is not abated, will have roughly $152 million worth of economic impacts on an annual basis uh, due to climate change. Um, these numbers don't include uh, things like increased storm damage, uh, property damage associated with increased storms, which we are experiencing, um, or uh, health costs, uh, increased health costs uh, for uh, health exposures. So uh, I view these numbers as pretty conservative. Um, those dollar values are in 2019 dollars when the study was reported. Uh, so of course the number will look different by the end of the century. So it, it does indicate that these impacts have some economic uh, potential to them if we don't address it. We also did a greenhouse gas inventory, uh, looking at uh, energy emissions, transportation emissions, uh, uh, solid waste emissions. Um, for the region, this is the uh, breakdown of our uh, emissions by sector, uh, electricity for residential, non-residential, uh, heating fuel for residential and non-residential, on-road transportation and uh, waste. Uh, so, uh, total emissions for the region is uh, about 3.8 million uh, metric tons annually. The little donut there shows the breakdown visually. That uh, emission level, by the way, is comparable to the city of St. Paul's uh, report last reported emissions, which are 2015. Uh, it's almost identical, actually. So, I mean, that that illustrates that our region has uh, uh, has you know impact, and also that means opportunity for making uh, contributive change. Uh, we've done kind of a, a regional comparison. Uh, what we do is we uh, identify what a, a community or a region's uh, GHG emissions are on a per capita basis. Um, that way we can com compare a small community with a large community and uh, it's the most, about the most fair way of comparing uh, emissions on a per person basis. Uh, and in the chart there, you see down at the bottom, the uh, gold is the uh, region four per capita emissions. And you can see we're kind of on the sort of upper third or so upper 25 percentile of all of the communities that you see. The light, lighter gray communities are all Minnesota communities. So we're a little bit heavier on uh, uh, emissions per capita uh, of all of the communities except for uh, Albert Lee. Now, of course, that's not every community in the state because we don't have data for every community in the state, but it's the communities that we do have data for. Uh, we did a greenhouse gas emission projection, which is just saying if we don't do anything, what kinds of emission changes might we anticipate? That's what this chart shows. The good news is we do anticipate our emissions to continue to drop over time, particularly around uh, the electric grid and also uh, through transportation emissions uh, due largely to uh, you know alternative fuels, uh, EVs and so forth uh, beginning to take hold to a degree and increasing uh, uh, MPG ratings, uh, fuel efficiency ratings. The, the less good news is that even though they are, we can't expect them to drop, they do not drop fast enough to uh, fall in line with IPCC recommendation. That's the panel for climate change uh, at the UN. Those blue dashed lines that you see, the one that's a little bit straighter at the top, that is the emission path that we want to stay. Uh, we want to adhere to if we want to stay to two degrees uh, Celsius of warming uh, by 2050. The other path is the suggested path that IPCC has uh, in order to uh, try to stay at 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius in warming. So those paths are showing us kind of where we want to get to. Um, for uh, this, for the region, what we did was we also included uh, an appendix for each county. So the county's share of those emissions, uh, we've broken that down county by county so everybody can see the region as well as their own specific uh, county if they'd like to see that. Um, you'll see on the per capita uh, for the county, we also compare the counties per capita against the regions per capita. So in that little chart, the darker blue is the county. So you can see how does my county compare on the waste sector, uh, on-road transportation, et cetera, compared to the larger region. 
the third document is the uh, ground cover uh, survey. So here we did uh, surveys. Again, we did this on census tract by census tract. The mapping, though, is shown by county to try to keep things a little bit more uh, tidy and organized. Um, we've got tree canopy coverage. We've got uh, uh, lawn. So this is manicured lawn coverage. Uh, we've got uh, water coverage, agricultural land coverage. Uh, and by the way, I should say that's that's apparently active agricultural land. So there may be some uh, discrepancy to that. There may be land that is technically agriculture that where maybe the crops, they just didn't put crop in the year that uh, we have uh, access to um, uh, satellite data. Uh, so there could be some discrepancy there, but it's gonna get us in the right ballpark. And then also impervious surface coverages. So think buildings, roads, uh, both light colored and dark colored. From that, we can calculate some of the land cover benefits, uh, which include uh, electric savings. Think putting trees around uh, buildings that can help to shield cold winter winds. It can also help provide some shading. There are ca calculations that we can apply to estimate the uh, energy savings associated with that, that the USDA has put together, USDA Forest Service. Uh, and also micro heat island impacts, uh, which really you know, largely is in our larger uh, uh, municipal uh, areas. Uh, we've uh, estimated some of the economic uh, value of our tree canopy in particular. So you know, pollution absorption, uh, carbon uh, absorption, uh, et cetera. And uh, we have a findings in there that kind of summarizes uh, some of the things that we found um, uh, county by county and uh, recommended uh, uh, changes for uh, tree canopy coverage and recommendations for how we might get there. Um, in terms of the findings, so we've got a breakdown. You can see that we've got, um, you know, in our grassland areas, uh, the largest part um, is agriculture, but within... Uh, uh, our non-agricultural land, we have a fair bit of manicured lawn that we can we could work to reduce, uh, replace with you know uh, uh, native grasses and so forth. And that chart just sort of shows the uh, breakdown of uh, of uh, um, ground cover by community group, uh, trees and so forth. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is the chart for the, the uh, grass cover. So we've got uh, almost 23% uh, of our uh, uh, grass coverage is uh, uh, manicured lawn. So that illustrates there's potential for some turf uh, change. Uh, within our impervious surface area, we've got both light and dark impervious surfaces. Um, our pavement area, our dark uh, pavement area is the lion's share of our impervious surface, which indicates that we have some opportunities we could mitigate micro heat island by thinking through strategies to reduce that. Uh, in terms of tree canopy coverage, we've put out potential goals that we're just offering up uh, as here's a potential goal to try to uh, achieve. Um, and the goal is expressed in terms of canopy increase over the existing tree, uh, tree canopy. In other words, if it says 6%, it means a 6% increase over its, the current amount of tree canopy. And then we also translate it into absolute land cover. Um, and these numbers come from kind of a potpourri. Largely, it's based on how much land is available, excluding things like, well, if land's already in agricultural use or it's got a building on it or a road on it, we're not thinking we're going to put a tree on it. Uh, so it's a combination of what's available as well as uh, areas that could benefit the greatest from uh, planting trees. You know, areas that are showing up with high micro heat island could benefit. Areas that show up with high vulnerable populations could benefit from trees. So it's kind of a potpourri of considerations that are outlined in the report. Uh, lastly, in the renewable energy potential study, we've looked at uh, renewable energy through the state, uh, renewable existing uh, uh, renewable energy, at least solar installations uh, known uh, through uh, the region in each uh, county, uh, as well as uh, the solar potential. Uh, for the region, the solar potential first, we identify, this is all through satellite data, we, we identify uh, solar uh, buildings that have solar potential, the count of buildings, and then we also calculate from those how much uh, solar could be installed on those uh, buildings, uh, and we do that first in terms of just total solar capacity, and then we also try to summarize it in terms of solar that's likely to be cost effective, so we have a kind of a net 
uh, optimize solar capacity. And so we call that um, out uh, county by county. Ted, do you mind if I pause you really quick? There's a question in the chat for you. Um, it's does uh, the tree canopy inventory take into account tree loss if emerald ash borer spreads to our region? It does. Uh, so the existing tree canopy numbers, uh, of course, don't because it's a snapshot. Uh, in terms of our uh, growth projection, our like recommended, hey, if you want to get to uh, a 5% increase, we do have calculations that try to uh, anticipate loss through emerald ash borer as well as just trees die, uh, and also include uh, calculations for, I mean, trees grow also. So uh, those projections we can provide on a county by county basis, how many trees do you need to plant likely in order to hit a specific goal? Uh, community-wide. So we do we do have some numbers that can anticipate that. Thank you. Um, so in the renewable energy potential study, we also kind of anticipate uh, how much uh, might be possible through um, uh, carport arrays. So that's arrays over parking areas and also through ground mounted. In our study, we call out sort of a, a reasonable assumption, and it's something like a half a percent of what's available. So we're not trying to be too aggressive. The point here is to try to come up with a total potential uh, uh, opportunity for uh, solar as one renewable uh, installation. And so mapping these out, we think we could we could hit 10% of uh, the area's current uh, electricity consumption through distributed solar pretty easily. That isn't to say that we couldn't hit more. And uh, certainly some of them might be a little bit more challenging than uh, we can anticipate at a high level. But we're saying 10% seems pretty darn achievable, uh, even through like 2030. And frankly, there are going to be economic impacts through the IRA that um, we think could make, maybe make those numbers increase a bit. We've also looked at plasma gasification. Plasma gasification is a waste to energy uh, uh, form that does not have uh, emissions associated with it in the same way that, uh, for instance, uh, incineration does. Um, it's basically a contained uh, phase change is kind of the way I think of it. And uh, its byproduct is a synth gas. Uh, think of it as a like a human-made uh, natural gas that can be used either as a natural gas replacement. It can also be used to convert it into hydrogen fuel. Uh, it can be converted into renewable diesel. Um, or can be converted into ammonia, which of course can now be used for fertilizer. So uh, we have taken uh, the waste stream, the current landfilled waste stream of the region, and uh, have calculated how much that, uh, that could produce in terms of those different energy sources. So if you use it for electricity, for instance, it could generate perhaps 91, 92 million kilowatt hours uh, annually. So as I said, all that's going to come out into a foundational document. The stuff I just uh, ran through as quickly as I could um, is summarized in the uh, baseline document. Uh, not everything is touched on, but the sort of uh, pertinent in, uh, information for each of the uh, groups. That's the document I would really like for you guys to review. You can absolutely dig into any of the other documents. They'll all be available on the website. Um, I do want to touch on a little, we had a couple of comments about, you know, there's some depressing news out there. And so just touching really rapidly, we have some great uh, things to build on, some great good news. I believe that we're entering into an era of great opportunity. The first thing not everybody realizes that uh, US emissions peaked 15 years ago. They peaked in uh, 20, uh, 2007. They have been on a pretty steady decline ever since, which is fantastic news. In our little corner of the world, uh, you know, the communities that we have worked with, these are just four examples of uh, measured uh, GHG reductions that they have uh, accomplished. Uh, you know, so that we've got uh, three of them listed here where their community-wide emissions are you know, a third lower than they were when they started on their journey. Um, and we're just a tiny little uh, firm uh, touching just a, a few communities. Um, so you start multiplying that around the country, we are having success. We are moving things forward. Uh, sometimes it doesn't feel like that, but it is. We have great opportunities related to funding. This year alone, we have the IIJA, which has $550 billion in that uh, act uh, aimed at new investments. And those new investments, many of them can align with climate action. And in fact, the Biden administration is encouraging that. Um, so think, you know, 
uh, opportunities to increase public transit, opportunities for electric uh, vehicle infrastructure or other infrastructure relating to uh, uh, no emission or low emission vehicles. Uh, we also, of course, have the, Infl uh, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, that has $391 billion <laughs> focused specifically at climate action. Some of that money will come out specifically as grants to help communities advance climate action plans. Uh, there's 150, uh, I think it's 150 million specific to that is going to be available to cities. Uh, and then there's another kitty that's going to be available for uh, states and uh, tribal entities. So we'll put together actually as a part of the plan document, the final plan document, we'll put together a little memo that tries to summarize some of those opportunities. But there is funding out there and a lot of it uh, for communities that can get out ahead of this. And I think having a plan in place helps. So I'm just going to uh, see if anybody has any questions. I know we're hitting time. Um, I'm sorry about that. Um, if, we, if we can hang together just a couple more minutes, if that's possible, that'd be great. So just seeing if there's any, uh, any questions. Otherwise, um, let me touch on... Uh, we do have a community survey out there. It's out, it's active right now. We've got 372 respondents. Let me just say the thing, the takeaway I want you to hear right now is that um, we have the majority of folks, respondents are concerned about climate change. The more, majority of folks thinks that our region should do something about uh, anticipating and adapting to climate change. Slightly fewer, but not fewer. Still a majority of folks think that communities should be doing something to reduce our emissions. Um, one thing, uh, we have pretty good coverage in, uh, by age group. I'm a, I'm, I would really love to see if we can get an increase in responses for our youth. Definitely 40 and, uh, and younger, um, but definitely 25 and younger. That category is a little small yet. Um, so for any of you that work with youth, that have connections with youth, um, if, you know, if we can get the word out, that would be great um, to try to get more responses in the survey. Um, there are some tools available if you're interested in helping to promote the survey. Uh, there's a link here on the uh, presentation. It'll take you to a, a, a media kit. The media kit's got a flyer that has a QR code that can take folks directly to the survey. Uh, it's got newsletter content. So if you have an organization that does newsletters or you want to do an email blast to groups that you're a part of, what have you, uh, you can use that content as a starter. There's also some social media content if you want to do some social media posts, something to, to take a stab at that. You don't have to do that, but if you are connected to groups uh, that you think uh, would love to provide input, we definitely want to get as much input as possible. Our intent is to have the survey open through the end of uh, January. And then what we will do is we'll summarize uh, what we're hearing from that survey and provide it back to this team as we're uh, thinking through detailed actions. The survey, by the way, uh, if you haven't taken it, we've got some general questions where we're trying to get people's feelings and understand what people are concerned about and also give them an opportunity to give us their thoughts about ideas. Like, hey, I think this is a great idea. We should do this, we should do that. So it's a pretty open-ended survey. Um, the last thing I wanna uh, tell you about here is that we do have, so we have some uh, 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 tools that we'll be sharing with you along the way. We share that through a web page. Uh, this is the link for it, and I will share it through a follow-up email. Uh, it does have a password, and the reason for that is that although I mean this is this will all be publicly available. I mean we're not we're not hiding things, but we we password protect it only because there will be some things that will be available for the team to talk to each other on, and we don't want people to accidentally delete comments or uh, you know interrupt. Uh, a thought and process. So that's why we password protect it just to help protect the team's effort while it's still happening. Uh, so the password is region four cap, capital R, and then capital CAP. Uh, again, this will be in a follow-up email. Um, our next steps are first, I wanna finalize our future meetings. Um, uh, and very importantly, we want to have you sign up for the three sub teams. There is a sign up spreadsheet that uh, spreadsheet that I showed that has the three groupings. Uh, that's the link for it here. And again, it'll be in a follow up email. And once you sign up for your three subgroups, 
please review the baseline document for your three sub teams. So that you have a, an, uh, you have a, the same starting point with everybody else in the sub team. And, and what we will do at our next meeting, you will see in the baseline document that each sub team has some potential goals that were just thrown out there. Like, hey, maybe this is a goal for the sector. What we'd like to do at our next meeting is to have you all uh, begin to discuss those goals and decide if you like them, if you want to change them, uh, if you uh, want to um, uh, get rid of uh, uh, some of those goals, uh, or if you are uh, want to add goals. So the next meeting is going to be all about goals. Where do we want to get to for each of these sub teams? Uh, and there's a starter point in the in that document. So with that, I'm sorry I was kind of rushing through this last bit. That's a lot of information to throw at you kind of abusive, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, as far as our next meeting, if you have the agenda available to you, you will see that we have put some suggested placeholders for our next meetings. And the thing that I'd like to just kind of feel out right now, if possible, is so we met here on a Wednesday. Um, the first thing that I like to try to do is let's identify a day of the week that we think will work largely. And then the second question after that is let's identify if, uh, hey, does a morning meeting work? Does a midday meeting work? Does a later in the day or in the early evening meeting work? What's gonna work best for the greatest number of people? So the first question I'm just gonna put out there for the group uh, here today is, do Wednesdays work well for this group? Uh, not worrying too much about the time necessarily, but in general, is Wednesday likely to be a, a pretty good day for folks? Or Anybody that is concerned knows of a, a specific concern for Wednesdays, maybe. Seeing, seeing some thumbs up. Okay. So hearing, not hearing that there's a concern with Wednesdays yet, and if there is, definitely uh, let us know. What I would suggest we would do is that if you look at the agenda, we've got some placeholder dates. Uh, one on the 18th of January for our next meeting, then on February 15th, then on March 15th, and then on April 12th. So roughly four week pacing there. Um, what I'm gonna suggest that we could do if, if Wednesdays in general feel like they might work, we will send out a, a kind of a doodle poll and what we're going to do is we're going to say, assuming that these, you know, these meeting dates, let us know uh, if you absolutely cannot make it. And then also a question that says, you know, I could make it in the mornings, I could make it in the middle of the day, I could make it in the evening kind of a thing. And the point for that is that we're going to try to feel out, hey, are these meetings going to work better if we do them, you know, starting at nine, or are they going to work better if they start them at noon, or is it going to work better if we start them at four, you know, just kind of feel out the right timing. So uh, we'll put together a little doodle poll exploring that, and we'll do the best that we can to try to kind of navigate to make it work as well as we can for everybody, okay? All right. Is there any uh, anything anybody wants to share? And again, I'm sorry this list last bit was a little rushy. One last minute question I was curious about, but maybe never everyone doesn't won't need to stick around for this is uh, how many respondents are we at for the survey? And would we maybe be able to get a little snapshot of the responses? Yeah, the uh, survey we're at three hundred and seventy two uh, right now. Um, unfortunately, uh, it'll be difficult for me to share I, I, if I. Uh, Google Forms doesn't have a convenient reporting methodology. It's kind of a drag. Um, so I can't, it's difficult to do a snapshot report. Um, and if I give access to, uh, to the actual survey, which I don't have a problem with, but it, then we have access to emails and that's probably inappropriate. I, I don't want to, I want to protect people. You know, people are, people are pro providing us emails and I want to make sure we don't get that out and around in a way that's in inappropriate. So um but I, I can take some of the charty answers and uh, send those out to you, you know, like some of the ones that I just shared, for instance. Um, but what I would definitely suggest is if there is anything that we can do to advance getting the word out for the opportunity to take the survey, that is definitely an area if, again, if anybody has the capacity or interest in, 
that can be very powerful to have this group, uh, you know, advocate for folks to to give us input because it will find its way into the process. You will all get, uh, you'll get when we're done with the survey, you'll get a summary, and then everything that anybody's written, you'll get in an appendix. So you'll see every single entry. Um, so all of it will come back. And and at one of our meetings, when we do share that back at meeting number three. What we're going to do is we're also going to try, we're going to hunt through all that and we're going to try to find those uh, comments that might be actionable or might be, hey, this is a really different idea, you know, um, and, and pull those out so you get kind of a summarized by team. Hey, here's some, here's some specific input that we want to make sure the team's seeing, you know. Thank you. You bet. All right. Anything else? I always feel like wanting to, now I just threw a whole bunch of stuff at you. Like, oh, let's just do a peaceful meditation for a moment here. I'm sorry. I got everybody keyed up. It's too much. <laughs> um, well, I, I would say, and I don't know if uh, Anna or Mark want to share anything, but from my perspective, I'm extremely grateful to be working with this team. Uh, I am very grateful for uh, all of your input is going to be very valuable. Uh, I am 100% certain about that because I work with teams doing this. We do this with lots of teams all over the place, and it's true every single time. And I can tell based on the group that we've got um, that is definitely going to be true here. So I'm very excited about that, and I'm grateful for that. So thank you very much. And I'll just add uh, thank you, everybody, for participating. And um, if you have questions along the way, I am uh, available by email or phone anytime, and uh, we'll uh, address everything we can and uh, look forward to uh, the next meeting with you all. Great. Thank, thank you 